Hey everyone, thanks for tuning in to D News Plus today. I am Trace. This is episode four of five in our series on the paranormal. So far we've talked about what paranormal even is and compared it to like supernatural and all these other things. We've talked about the research into paranormal and what that looks like because, you know, how can science study something that's outside of the realm of science, which we talked about in the previous episode. Today we're going to talk about how science can fail to disprove something that's outside of the realm of science, which it turns out is actually pretty easy. So make sure you stick around for all of these episodes. Subscribe down below and let us know if you have any ideas for future shows. Also, you can find this show as an audio podcast over on iTunes. If you're interested in not watching my face, that's fine. I'm not going to take offense. So now that we have some scientific truth behind so-called paranormal activity, what are these things that science can't prove? Earlier, we mentioned deja vu. It literally translates to already seen, and it's a sense of familiarity with something that shouldn't be familiar. Maybe you think you had a dream about something that happened today. Oh my gosh, I remember when you just did that. Didn't you already do that? Deja vu. But there are some theories on how and why this is happening, but technically it's in the realm of the paranormal in that we don't understand it, right? Scientists think it has something to do with misfiring brain signals related to memory and recollection, or maybe has something to do with schizophrenia or anxiety or even epilepsy. Don't get worried though, they don't think that it means that you have <laughs> any of those things if you've had deja vu. But most of these are just hypotheses. But I'm gonna quote some scientists here and just give you an idea of how scientists talk about something that they don't understand in a scientific way. In the 2005 journal Neurology, there is something where they're talking about deja vu and they say, quote, several neuroanatomical and psychological models of the deja vu experience are highlighted, implicating the perceptual, mnemonic, and effective regions of the lateral temporal cortex, hippocampus, and amygdala in the genesis of deja vu. A possible genetic basis for a neurochemical model of deja vu is discussed. In science speak, that means we have no idea what's going on here. We'll just list some parts of the brain that we looked at and then talk about how there might be some chemicals involved. So they don't know what this is, which makes it outside of the little box that we've been talking about throughout this series about the normalcy versus the paranormalcy, right? There's another thing that scientists often discuss that they don't really understand, and that's placebos. A 2004 University of Michigan study had patients who were told that a placebo was actually a pain pill. So then they took the pill, and their brains released the same amounts of endorphins as people who took a real pain pill. That's the placebo effect. That's how it works. And it works even if you don't trick people. Most people have heard of the placebo effect. But there was another study published in PLOS One where they had 80 patients who were suffering from irritable bowel syndrome. IBS is awful. And they were randomized in this study to receive either a placebo or no treatment. Those who received a placebo, though, were told they were getting the placebo, just a sugar pill. 59% of people on the placebo half of the study got better. 35% with no treatment at all. Why? The placebo effect. Even though they knew that it was a fake pill, the receiving of that medicine, I'm putting medicine in finger quotes here, gave them some kind of paranormal experience where they were able to then fire off their neurons and the dopamine was excreted into their brain, made them feel better, and increased their healing process. And these are just a couple of examples of things that you hear a lot in science, but technically could be considered paranormal. There are some other more exciting ones that you may have also heard of. Uh, the 1518 Dancing Plague. If you haven't heard of this, it's amazing, look it up. A woman named Frau Trefea began dancing like crazy on a hot day in Strasbourg, and other people joined in at a frantic pace. And then a month later, there were 400 people all dancing, and they couldn't stop. This is a well-documented event, and the physicians blamed it on hot blood. The only cure that they had was to keep on dancing, which sounds like a Saturday night, but that's not what it is, because they were doing this for a month. They hired musicians and they hired professional dancers and people were out there dancing, they built a stage, people were collapsing from exhaustion, some people died from heart attacks and strokes, and no one knows why. No one knows what was going on, that's why they call it the dancing plague. At the time, there was widespread famine, there were smallpox and syphilis and leprosy and all of these things, and so scientists today think that it could have something to do with that. The mass stress leading to this mass psychogenic 
hysterical illness. It also, of course, could be down to the eating of ergot, a psychotropic mold that grows on rye that causes delirium, hallucinations, seizures, and stuff. You've heard about it. But it's hard to know. This happened in 1518. Sounds like quite the party, except for the death part. And it's difficult to study because at the time, it wasn't like there were people set up to do a double-blind study of what was going on with these dancers versus those dancers. And if we give these ones placebos, do they stop? And if we give these ones medicine, you know, that wasn't something that they could do. It was outside of the realm of normal scientific achievement, and therefore they couldn't study it. Some argue that unless it happens again, we'll never know the answer, and some argue that it has happened again. Some argue that that's just called Coachella, but either way. Easter Island is a small island a thousand miles from anything out in the Pacific, and we don't really know how people got there. But we do know that when they got there, they formed a civilization and eventually built moai, these giant heads that are placed all over the island. We don't know how they necessarily did that or what they did with them and why they were there. They're 13 feet tall, they weigh 14 tons. Maybe it was to honor their ancestors, maybe aliens. I mean, I'm not saying aliens, but you know, nobody knows. So these are all outside of the realm of what scientists can determine, can answer, can figure out. We've tried and we've tried and they have hypotheses and theories and they've tested all of these things, but we can't always answer these questions. One of my favorites outside of the realm of science is the Voynich Manuscript. We've talked about it on discoverynews.com for years. Even before the D News videos series existed, we were talking about it. It's a thick leather bound book that was written in the 15th century. It was purchased in 1912 and it's written in a language that no one knows, nobody. The script is completely foreign, and no one knows what it says, but it looks really important, and it's very weird that no one can translate it in any way, and it could describe topics about astronomy and biology and cosmology and, like, herbal pharmaceutical things, and uh, nobody knows what it says, but it's super intriguing to a lot of scientists, and so many people have tried to figure it out, and no one has yet cracked it which is just so cool. Although there are, of course, people who think it's a hoax. Then, of course, there are the classics, you know, Bigfoot and Loch Ness. Like, we told you the guy who claimed to find Bigfoot admitted that he lied, but there have been other sightings, people who believe that they've seen Bigfoot, people who believe they've seen Loch Ness, other than the people who originally came up with the idea. And scientists are finding new species of animal all the time, and a majority of the ocean is unexplored, and it's, you know, pretty much impossible to cordon off a whole chunk of forest and search every rock and tree for something like a primitive giant Harry and the Hendersons kind of guy. But scientists can't prove that it doesn't exist, and that's kind of where we're trying to get here. There are a lot of things that science can't explain because the scientific method is flawed in a lot of ways. We can only study things in very controlled conditions so that we can understand every variable. And if you don't understand all the variables, then you don't have a valid study. And that's really tough when it comes to studying things like whether a dinosaur might live in a giant Scottish lake. And the reason that it's tough isn't just because of the scientific method, but also because science is expensive, right? It's difficult enough to get money to fund HIV and cancer research and, you know, trying curing babies of various diseases. Why would people fund something for something that may not even exist? Something that isn't beneficial or isn't harmful and, you know, science can't really explain yawning, but isn't hurting anybody and we've been doing it for a long time, so whatever. Let's kind of leave it alone. Why throw millions of dollars out there to try and study it? On top of that, pop culture sort of hurts some of science in this way. There are lots of these ghost hunting television shows, and they steal the limelight from actual science. There are people who are putting real money into trying to figure out if ghosts are real. And parapsychologists used to book talks and be able to, to fund their research until shows like these hunting ghost shows came on and sure, they're entertaining, but it's not like these people are super professional, so parapsychologists are all like, this sucks, because now no one's booking our talks, and they're giving their field of study such a bad name that now no one can study ghosts anymore, seriously. Which is also something that I feel like I need to say, seriously, there were people studying ghosts and getting money for it. I love it. In the end, though, these things are hard to disprove. And we've been talking a lot about disproving paranormal and involving the scientific method and testing the hypotheses, but if you're testing whether Bigfoot is real or not, it's kind of difficult to come up with a test to disprove it. It's hard to replicate, because, you know, seeing is believing, and like I said, you can't exactly 
take a whole chunk of Oregon and say, okay, let's look for Bigfoot in this area and nothing will move while we do so. <laughs> it's just not possible. John Napier, a prominent scientist and Bigfoot researcher says, uh, he, he's a British primatologist, there are no shortage of problems to tackle and it is not surprising that scientists prefer to investigate the probable rather than beat their heads against the wall of the faintly possible. So what it comes down to is, do you want an answer that only has negative evidence that says, hey, well, we can't disprove it, or are you just not gonna study it? And most scientists go with the latter. Some scientists do admit their beliefs that go into the paranormal. Freeman Dyson, a theoretical physicist, uh, you may recognize the name not from the vacuum, but from the Dyson sphere, the idea that a type two civilization could capture every bit of energy coming out of the sun in their solar system, he studied quantum electrodynamics, astronomy, and nuclear engineering, and also believes in ESP. This guy thinks you can read minds and intuit the future. He stated that paranormal phenomena are real, but they lie outside the limits of science. Freeman Dyson is much smarter than me. He is also correct in that. We can't prove the paranormal because it usually happens when we're really emotional or stressed, but also it's quote, inherently incompatible with controlled scientific procedures. Another uh, theoretical physicist, Francis Collins, won the Nobel Prize in Physics in the 70s for his research on superconductivity and pretty much got bored with that because, you know, you won the Nobel Prize, what's next? And he read the book, The Tao of Physics, and saw parallels between quantum physics and Eastern mysticism, and so changed his field of interest. Rupert Sheldrake, a former Cambridge University cell biologist, now parapsychologist researcher, did a whole TED talk about the science delusion stressing the conflict between the scientific method and science as a belief system, basically saying that the current method is flawed and that we need to be more open-minded. The interesting thing about that is that the talk was banned. What's up with that, Ted? Is that not an idea worth sharing? I feel like it is. And there are a bunch of other scientists out there that all believe in various things. A survey in the 80s found that 29% of the world's top scientists believed in ESP. And while it's an old survey, that percentage, what, would it, half of that make you feel better? 15% is still a lot of scientists. So what if these scientists are right? What if it's worth studying this? That's what we're gonna talk about tomorrow, whether it's worth studying the paranormal, and if you can get that money, what do you do with it? So make sure you come back tomorrow for more DNews Plus. Subscribe so you get that episode right in your inbox. Let us know down in the comments if you think that it's worth studying the paranormal, and if there are things outside of our understanding. I'm sure many of you have those beliefs. Please tell us about it in the comments. You can also find me on Twitter. I'm at Trace Dominguez if you wanna chit chat about this stuff. Thanks for tuning in, and we will see you tomorrow on DNews Plus.